thank you everybody for coming out. Sorry for the cramped space. Who knew that uh, giant earthquakes would be so popular? <laughs> I, I am uh, giving a talk Saturday in McMinnville at the community center there at 1.30. So if you don't want to stick around in this hot room with no seat, you're, because that way you can be in the wine country. And I, trust me, my talks are a whole lot more fun to watch after you've had a glass or two of wine. Yes, thank you, City of Salem. And Roger is the emergency manager for the city. And CERT teams, thank you very much for coming out and helping set all this up. Red Cross is here as well, and who else is here? Who is making the, who is making the buttons? That was Marion County's folks. Cool. Everybody got their Prophet of Doom button? All right, hey. Good. My name is James Roddy. I am the Earth Sciences Information Officer. Y'all can help me. I need a Vanna White to do this stuff with the Oregon Department of Geology. We're a small state agency. Our mission is to uh, follow a outdated business plan <laughs> while trying to fly under the uh, budget radar of the state legislature and the governor's office. That's a joke. <laughs> Any legislators here tonight? Oh, good. Yeah. All right, so I can get away with saying that. And since I'm a state employee and it's after 5 o'clock, I have to take a break in about 15 minutes, <laughs> if you don't mind, okay? Don't want don't to be charging you guys with, you know, more tax dollars. We're a small state agency. We are tasked with identifying and characterizing natural hazards in the state of Oregon. Landslides, coastal erosion, flooding, volcanic eruptions, that one's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, disasters are us. Um, and we have some incredible tools that we're using now. Laser-based terrain mapping for finding landslides. And it actually strips away all the vegetation using a computer program once you have this incredible data and we can see things we've never seen before, including hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of landslides in any given area. So um, the technology is really amazing. And then we work with communities to help mitigate for things like landslides or flooding or work with communities like this tsunami outreach program that uh, Althea Turner, Al Althea Rizzo, with Oregon Emergency Management and I uh, work on at the coast. She just got married six months ago? A year ago. A year ago, okay. Well, my how time flies. Work with communities to help them get ready for the big one. Now, tonight I'm going to talk about what Native American myths, ghost forests, and surfing elephants can teach us about Great Cascadia earthquakes. And yes, you will get to see elephants surf. And if you're not familiar, how, how many of you know a little bit about Cascadia, Great Cascadia earthquakes? Oh man, there are lots of folks here that are going to have a lot of fun with this then. Because if you're not familiar with Great Cascadia earthquakes, <laughs> by the time I get done with you, you are going to run home, grab the tinfoil, and make your little hats, right? And by the way, 2012 is just around the corner. Just keep that in mind. We live in one of the most beautiful places on Earth. We are some pretty lucky folks to live here in Oregon. Um, the coastline, an amazing place, I spend a lot of time there, where the North American continent meets the largest ocean in the world. But everywhere you go in Oregon, Eastern Oregon, out to the Wallawas and the Steens, um, up into the, the, the Coast Range and the Cascades, just beautiful, beautiful places. What has created this beautiful, dynamic landscape is geologic processes. And what comes along with 
creating these incredibly beautiful landscapes, these geologic processes, it also creates some pretty serious natural hazards. So folks at the coast just a couple of years ago went through a hurricane. They had 160 mile an hour winds. They had sustained winds for three days. This is in December of 2007. This was basically a hurricane. They called it a tropical cyclone. The name, the official name from the National Weather Service was the Great Gale. And there were coastal counties on the north coast and the south coast that had no power for a week, no way to communicate with anybody, roads so clogged with trees they couldn't go anywhere, they couldn't get anywhere anyway because they had no power and none of the gas stations in Clatsop County had generators. So they learned firsthand in a very, you know, kind of limited way what it's like once you hit a natural disaster and it takes over your life for a while. The Columbia Gorge is another place that I just love to visit and play at. It's also seen a couple of the biggest geologic events in the Earth's history. About 15 million years ago, lava flows from the border of what is today Idaho and Oregon and Washington flowed out, covered almost 200,000 square miles. In fact, some of those big sea stacks you see at the coast are from those lava flows that traveled 400 miles to the coast over millions and millions of years. Some places as much as three or four miles thick of lava. And the other is about 15,000 years ago, the Missoula floods, one of the largest floods in the history of the world during the last ice age. A ice dam, the ice sheet comes down from Canada, blocks a river over in Montana, creates an ice dam that's 2,000 feet high, blocks the river for years and years. It creates a lake that's the equivalent of two great lakes. And it overtops the ice dam, breaks it, the water roars through Montana, through Idaho, into eastern Washington, what's now called the Channel Scablands or the Palouse, and down into the Columbia. If you were standing at Vista House when this happened 15,000 years ago, and there certainly may have been Native Americans that witnessed this, Vista House is 600 feet above the river. The water would have been 200 feet over your head at Vista House. An 800 foot wall of water as it came down, when it got to Portland, where Portland is today, it got constricted and it actually split. Some of it continued on to the Pacific, but a whole big portion of the water rolling and tumbling headed up the Willamette all the way to Eugene, pooled in the Willamette 400 feet deep, and then turned around and went out. This didn't happen just one time. This happened over and over, over a few thousand years. And scientists today think this may have happened as many as 80 or 90 times. Huge, massive, 800 foot walls of water coming down the Columbia. Geology is so cool. <laughs> one of the reasons the Willamette is one of the best places in the world to grow, tops, uh, to grow crops is we have all of Montana's topsoil. <laughs> Pretty amazing. And this is out near McMinnville. This is called an erratic. This is a granite boulder from Montana. That's what was being carried in the flood. Giant chunks of ice with giant boulders wrapped up in it. Pretty amazing stuff. But once again, these geologic forces, now that we have humans here, can cause some pretty serious natural disasters. And this is Vernonia in 2007, 80% of the town underwater. Just 7,000 years ago, the largest mountain in Oregon blew its top, Mount Mazama. And I mean by top, I mean the top mile of the mountain was blown up into the air in a cataclysmic explosion. We know it today as Crater Lake. Right, just 7,000 years ago. And there were Native Americans that saw that happen as well. In fact, we tend to forget we live within an active volcanic, <coughs> volcanic mountain range. We get reminded about that every now and then. 
But you know what? Over the last 4,000 years, there have been 57 major eruptions in the Cascades. That's more than a couple of times a century. And if the last one was 1980, there is certainly a possibility that we will see another volcanic eruption, maybe in our lifetimes. In fact, if you count Mount St. Helens, about half of these major volcanic eruptions have happened in Oregon, if you stretch the border up to include Mount St. Helens. <laughs> well, the Oregon Territory, how about that? So, we're lucky on May, was it 18th, May 18th or so, in 1980 that the wind was blowing the wrong direction or else it would have been a natural disaster for us here in the Willamette Valley. This process of this dynamic landscape and these big natural disasters and this beautiful, beautiful landscape is all driven by plate tectonics. It's what my geology professor called the dance of the continents. The earth is broken up into plates, rafts, and these rafts, these plates are in constant motion. The North American continent is moving at about an inch a year to the west. The Pacific plate is moving in a whole bunch of other different areas. And where the Pacific plate comes in contact with North America and South America and Asia and Australia, it creates what's called the ring of fire. Because this is where most of the major volcanic eruptions and large earthquakes happen anywhere in the world, is along the Pacific Rim. This is the most powerful process on Earth. We have, yeah, there we are. Well, you wouldn't know, would you? We have sitting off the Pacific Northwest coast, off the coast of Northern California, stretching all the way up to Southern British Columbia, a remnant of a very ancient plate that's been diving under North America for 150 million years called the Juan de Fuca Plate. It's actually started to break up into other little tiny plates. It has the potential where the Juan de Fuca Plate and the North American Plate come together to create the largest earthquakes on Earth. We've just witnessed in just three months ago as we go back around the Pacific Rim to Japan. Japan experiences up to 300 earthquakes a day. Yes, one of the most active places on Earth. It's where four tectonic plates come together. The Pacific Plate pushing against the North American Plate and the Eurasian Plate, the Philippine Plate doing the same. And on March 11th, they experienced a magnitude 9 earthquake. It's called a subduction zone earthquake because the Pacific Plate is actually diving under Japan. But the plates get locked together over hundreds of years. And when they break, that's when you get the earthquake. Subduction zone earthquakes are the largest earthquakes that can happen anywhere in the world. Every time there is a subduction zone earthquake, 1964, the Alaskan earthquake, 2004, the Sumatran earthquake, a magnitude 9. The Chilean earthquake, last year, a magnitude 8.8. .8. And this earthquake, the Japanese earthquake, a magnitude 9. Every time there is one of these types of earthquakes anywhere in the world, it shifts the North Pole. This one shifted the North Pole by 4 inches. It slows the Earth's rotation, and it changes the shape of the Earth. The Earth gets a little bit flatter on the poles. Because what happens, these two plates are pushing against each other. The stress becomes too great. They break apart. The whole island of Honshu in Japan moved as much as 6 to 18 feet. That much mass changes the Earth's rotation. Because now you've moved a huge mass and the Earth starts to wobble a little bit and has to get back to its regular rotation. So these are huge, huge earthquakes. Hundreds of thousands of times larger than, say, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. 
The Haitian earthquake, magnitude 7, last year as well. This earthquake was over a thousand times larger than the Haitian earthquake. It would take a thousand magnitude 7 earthquakes to equal a magnitude 9 earthquake. It would take a thousand mag are you taking notes? Yeah. Note no, oh, no. It would take a thousand magnitude seven earthquakes to equal one magnitude nine earthquake. The Japanese have lived on those islands for over thirty thousand years. They have lived through a lot of earthquakes. And in modern times, going back maybe just a, a few hundred years, when many coastal communities experience the earthquake because they generate tsunamis, they put up what's called tsunami stones, reminders to the people who live in those communities to be careful. In fact, here's one in a town called Aniyoshi, and it says, high dwellings are the peace and harmony of our descendants. Remember the calamity of great tsunamis. Do not build homes below this point. This one was erected in 1933 after a killer tsunami. But some of these tsunami stones at the coast are hundreds of years old. But people forget. You, remove, you get removed a few generations and you tend to forget the lessons that you've been taught by your parents and your grandparents. And so the Japanese stopped paying attention to the tsunami stones and they began building their coastal cities closer and closer to the water. And here's the story of the town just below the tsunami stone. The district of Taro in Japan's Iwate prefecture was protected by a sea wall stretching for one and a half miles and rising up to 10 meters. Even so, the massive tsunami triggered by the magnitude 9 earthquake earlier this month devastated the town, leaving houses wedged against the sea walls and others washed away. Following a massive tsunami in 1896 that killed nearly 2,000, the town's inhabitants believed their new sea walls could withstand the worst waves imaginable. I've heard there were people who didn't think that a wave this big would come and were just sitting in their houses having tea. They must have thought that the wave couldn't go over the walls. There were people still in their houses, you know. Hundreds are still missing in the small fishing town and almost all the boats destroyed. Fujisawa worries the town may never recover, as it consists mainly of elderly people and the cost to rebuild will be enormous. The earthquake and tsunami left at least 28,000 people dead or missing across northeastern towns and cities. About a quarter of a million people are living in shelters, and the total damage caused could top 300 billion US dollars, making it the world's costliest natural disaster. Our brains are wired to care about a couple of generations on one side and you know a couple of generations on the other side and once you get past two generations you begin to forget and that's what we saw happen in Japan in fact here's one of the tsunami stones lucky to survive because the tsunami was much much higher than the tsunami stone it was is is itself because this event was unimaginable to Japanese scientists. They're some of the best scientists, geologists, seismologists in the world. They said this could never happen, an earthquake this size. Hubris. So here's a wonderful satellite image of the island of Honshu. The largest cities, Tokyo, the metropolitan area of Tokyo is 35 million people. Wouldn't you like to live there? <laughs> Sendai is a town about the size of Portland, but the, port, but the metro area around Sendai is 9 million people. When the earthquake happened, it affected, gosh, 
70, 80,000 square miles in Japan. And I mean, people got the hell shaken out of them, over 80,000 square miles. And it, it extended much farther than that. But the tsunami only affected, really, three prefectures. Prefectures are like states. And the majority of the fatalities came from these three prefectures. In fact, of the 25,000 people that perished in this event, 93% of them drowned. The earthquake, you take away the 93%, now you're talking just about a few hundred people, possibly, from the earthquake itself. That's the amazing thing about subduction zone earthquakes. They don't kill people. They shake, but they don't really kill people. It's the other things that happen that go along with that earthquake. The tragedy of this event was, and here's what happened, March 11th. A 300 mile long chunk of the seafloor was ripped apart as these two plates pulled each other apart. The, the, the Asian plate, the North American plate, and the Pacific plate. We were talking about that, uh, this this morning in the office. And the seafloor was offset by as much as 120 feet. And by offset, I mean ripped apart. And that's what caused the tsunami. The tragedy of the 25,000 fatalities in this event was not only that they didn't think it could happen, and it did, but in 1896, in pretty much the exact same spot, they got a magnitude 8.5 earthquake that killed 22,000 people from the tsunami in the same place. In 1933, they got a magnitude 8.4 earthquake that killed thousands more people in pretty much exactly the same place. And if you look up at the top of the screen, the island of Hokkaido, which is just north of Honshu, in 1952, in 1963, in 1968, and in 1969, they got magnitude eight plus earthquakes that generated tsunamis there. In 1993, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake killed hundreds of people on the island of Hokkaido, at Okushiri. And yet, people didn't know what to do when the ground shook at the Japanese coast. And they are the best prepared place on Earth for earthquakes and tsunamis. Because they weren't prepared for an event like this, the response took much longer than it should have. This is a headline, Japanese perplexed. You can understand because there's the first responders back there in that giant pile back there. But, and if this was a headline in the United States, it would not use the word perplexed. <laughs> what do you think? Pissed? Maybe something even a little stronger? You're talking about tens of millions of people that are affected by an event like this. And power's gone, and communication's gone, and being able to travel is gone. And it takes a very long time to mount a response to help millions and millions of people. This is all getting to a point, don't you think? There, some amazing images that have come out of this. One of the things that happens in these great subduction zone earthquakes, when the Pacific plate is pushing against the Asian plate, the coast of Japan actually bulged upward from the pressure hundreds and hundreds of years. When the earthquake happened and the seafloor was ripped apart and the island of Japan lurched eastward as much as 18 feet, it also dropped because it had relaxed. And now, this is a permanent scene in coastal towns in northern Japan 
At high tide, people have to wear boots because their town is underwater. And when we get our big one, this is the same thing we'll see in Seaside, in Cannon Beach, in Warrington, in Gearhart, and other coastal communities in Oregon. Because it doesn't come back. It takes hundreds and hundreds of years for the coast to begin bulging upward again. The earthquake lasted in some places six minutes. 20 miles deep. And as I said, out of the 15,281 fatalities, 93% of those were from the tsunami. The people that lived in this area of Japan were elderly as well. And so of the fatalities, 63% were 60 plus years in age. 190,000 buildings damaged or destroyed, and most of the buildings, once again, are in the areas that were ravaged by the tsunami. Outside of the tsunami zone, their building codes in Japan protected their buildings, for the most part. 25 million tons of rubble. They expect it may take five or six or even 10 years to remove that much rubble. Where, you, where do you put all of that? It's just staggering. And they're building 72,000 new homes. The people around the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, they evacuated 80,000 people that will never be able to go home. Wow. As I said, a response of this magnitude, like that, takes a long time to get rolling. This is a grocery store in Tokyo two weeks after the earthquake. How many of you have put away your uh, emergency supplies? <laughs> this is the line for water. They're still shipping in water because there's still over a million people in Japan that don't have access to fresh water. This is the line for gasoline. And when you get your car up there, they give you three liters. Right, what's that, about a gallon and a half? Oh, yeah, well they're not giving you much. And you're gonna wait a long, long time for it. That was one of the problems in northern Honshu Island. It was because the communities had suffered some tsunami damage and the roads had been damaged, they couldn't get fuel trucks into the area either. So there was nobody getting in or out of this area. Millions and millions of people stranded. People could only communicate or find out about loved ones or friends by going down to local shelters and looking through lists after lists after lists because communications were so disrupted. People were actually able to use Twitter to some degree to send some text messages and to use Facebook all of you over 30 years old, find somebody under 30 years old, <laughs> and learn how to text and use Twitter. Because that may be the only way, if we get this big earthquake, that you are gonna be able to communicate with friends and family. There were a quarter of a million people in shelters after the first week. Today, two months later, there are still over 100,000 people in shelters. March, April, May, almost into June. Three months. But now they have these really nice cardboard walls. Now, if you've ever, you know, being in a shelter for just a couple of hours is, is in agony. Um, so you can imagine what this is like. Classrooms as well. And the end of civilization as we know it. <laughs> Disney characters visiting the shelters. <sighs> <laughs> this is the Fukushima power plant just before the first wave arrived. The Japanese 
the TEPCO, the company that owned this, and the, the geotechnical engineers that did the studies on it said there would never be a, an earthquake any larger than about a magnitude seven and a half. So we'll build a 40 foot seawall and that'll protect the backup generators right on the other side of the seawall. You see that little white line on the horizon right there? That's a 40 foot wall of water. And this is what it looked like as it arrived. And this is the beginning of the wave. So imagine the first wave being 10, 20, maybe 30 feet higher than this. And this is my favorite picture. This is the TEPCO executives apologizing to every individual family that has been displaced from this tragedy. I think our elected officials could learn something from this. <laughs> Luckily, I am not an elected official. Pretty amazing. How do we know something like this could happen here? You can blame it on this guy. This fellow is named Brian Atwater, and he is a certified smart person. He, he works for the US Geological Survey. In, with the eruption of Mount St. Helens, that began speculation that we might have the potential for these big subduction zone earthquakes. Up until then, conventional wisdom was, you know, you've got the Juan de Fuca plate diving under North America, but it, since it's just a little tiny remnant of this old plate, maybe it's stopped. Or it's now a nice smooth process because there's not much of it left unlike any other subduction zone anywhere in the world. Well, Brian came along and said, I don't buy that. And he had gone up to Alaska and looked at the evidence from the 1964 subduction zone earthquake. He had gone down to Chile, where they had, in 1960, experienced the largest earthquake in recorded history, a magnitude 9.5. That's an earthquake so large, it's larger than all the earthquakes in the 20th century combined, including the magnitude 9.2 Alaskan earthquake. Big, big earthquakes. So he knew what he was looking for, and he was challenged by his boss, go out and find evidence that this might have happened here in the past. And one day he was out in his canoe paddling along the Copalis River, and he came across the evidence, and it was the ghost forest. <laughs> A western red cedar forest. Huge trees, 600, 700 years old. Growing very happy off near the coast. Coast is bulging upward. Earthquake happens. The coast drops. Now the tsunami roars in and out for 24 hours. But after it leaves, these trees are now at mean tide. And every time there's a high tide, the sea rushes in and stays in and out. And eventually, they die from the seawater. But they're red cedars, so they stand forever. That's why we build things out of them. And Brian came along and saw this and had an aha moment and had, all, had tree rings, samples taken, and they all came back that all the trees had died at pretty much exactly the same time. He had also been digging around in, oh, and we can see these in Oregon as well. Neskowin, anybody seen the stumps out in Neskowin? Okay, that is a forest from a subduction zone earthquake from 2,000 years ago. Those are 2,000 year old tree stumps. I wanna go down and get a couple of pieces and make, you know, like, prophet of doom, uh, you know, <laughs> things out of it, necklaces and stuff. Anyway, where are we going? Brian had also been looking in tidal marshes up and down the Pacific Northwest coast, and more and more people now got involved in that process. This is Rob Witter, who I work with at the Oregon Department of Geology. He's in a Sitka bog over about a mile inland off Cannon Beach. And what he's looking for is a thin layer of sand. And anywhere geologists went, from northern California coast 
up through the southern British Columbia coast. Every time they stuck one of these probes down into the marshes, they came up with this. This is a layer of tsunami sand. Topsoil, tidal muds, tsunami sand. And this was from the same event that killed the western red cedars. A layer of sand about that thick. And as they dug down into these tidal marshes, they found a layer cake. Tidal mud, tsunami sand, topsoil, tidal mud, tsunami sand, topsoil. Because for millions and millions and millions of years, this process has repeated itself over and over and over. Bulge, drop, bulge, drop. Here's a good slide that really shows what you're looking at. Toon sands, topsoil, because topsoil is forming because everything's bulging upward. And Native Americans had used fire pits here. Everything drops, tsunami comes in, but look up at the top, there's grass growing in topsoil again. Ironically, and this is all happening in the 1980s into the early 1990s. That's how long we've known that we had the potential for one of these big, big earthquakes. It's just the last 20 or 25 years or so. And the final puzzle piece came from Japan. Somebody who had studied with Brian Atwater, Kenji Sataki, went back to Japan and began looking through old dusty books, written records, for evidence of past earthquakes. And they found lots and lots of evidence, but most of the time it was associated with an earthquake that had struck the Japanese coast and then generated the tsunami. But they came across what was called an orphan tsunami, a tsunami not associated with any earthquakes that they could identify. They thought, well, maybe this matches up with the tree ring samples and, and the carbon dating that Brian's been doing over in the Pacific Northwest. Let's invite him over. Brian is a certified smart person. This is going on in the early 1990s. He learns to speak Japanese. And he goes over to Japan because he has to see it and read it with his own eyes. And this is the book that came out of it. And what Kenji Sataki and his researchers and people in the Pacific Northwest that were studying this realized from all this evidence was that on January 26, 1700, at 9 o'clock at night, a magnitude 9 earthquake, very similar to what just happened in Japan, ripped the seafloor apart off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, generating a huge wall of water that slammed into the coast and destroyed many Native American villages there. But the water also headed across the Pacific at 500 miles an hour, where 10 hours later, it hit the Japanese coast. Still a 15 to 20 foot wall of water. And it sank ships, destroyed villages, and went down in their written records. And that paper was published in 1995, and the orphan tsunami of 1700 came out a couple of years later. It's only in the last 15 years that everybody has been convinced that we had the potential for these great earthquakes. There is a group, however, that has been in the Pacific Northwest for over 14,000 years that lived with these great events dozens and dozens of times, but nobody paid any attention to them. Native Americans who lived in, at the coast, we know they've been at the coast for at least 10,000 years, and only about 1% of all the Native American stories in the Pacific Northwest have survived to today. But a number of those stories talk about great events that happened in the past. And up until the mid-1990s, everybody thought they were just myths and legends and you know, really neat stories. They didn't realize that they talked about real events that had happened in the past. But Native Americans had an incredible oral tradition where they passed these stories on for generation to generation, possibly for thousands of years. And this is one of my favorite stories, and it's called Thunderbird and Killer Whale.
Thunderbird kept a watchful eye upon the tribes that honored him, even snatching whales from the ocean to help feed the people in times of need. Underneath its wings were lightning snakes that flashed with fire. When Thunderbird beat his wings, thunder boomed across the landscape. At the time of the Great Flood, Thunderbird fought a terrible battle with Killer Whale, who was starving the people by killing other whales and depriving the people of meat and oil. Thunderbird left his mountain cave and soared out over the coastal waters, then plunged into the ocean and seized Killer Whale. Lightning snakes flashed and thunder boomed across the land. The waters rose to great heights and rose again higher and higher. Many canoes came down in trees and were destroyed and many lives were lost. Thunderbird lifted Killer Whale out of the ocean and carried him high into the air. Thunderbird dropped Killer Whale to the land. Another terrible battle began. Mountains were shaken by the noise and trees were uprooted in their struggle. At last, Thunderbird was victorious and the people rejoiced. Killer Whale had a son, Subbas, who vowed revenge on Thunderbird. Another great struggle took place, but Subbas was vanquished as well. In this context, it's easy to see that this is a story about earthquakes and tsunamis. But once again, only in about the last 15 years have we begun to identify many, many Native American stories associated with great earthquakes and tsunamis. Anybody know who Subbas was in this story? If Thunderbird and Killer Whale were the earthquake and the tsunami, who was Subbas? He was the aftershocks, because he was a little bit smaller and easier to defeat. Pretty neat story. Here's what's going on off the Pacific Northwest coast. And here we are again, yes. I think that's still pointing to Portland. Yeah, well, you get the idea. Here's, here's the little tiny remnant of the ancient plate, the Juan de Fuca plate, as North America moves west. And you can see the Pacific plate doing all kinds of weird stuff. And I'll spend a couple of hours going over this for you. Um, in Oregon, we don't get a lot of earthquakes. We live in a quiet zone sandwiched between Washington and California. Washington actually gets six times more earthquakes than we do in Oregon. These are the largest earthquakes in recorded history. Scotts Mills in 93, which I'm sure everybody that was living here felt. Nice big kind of ka-chunk. Magnitude 5.6 did $30 million worth of damage. We are so not ready for any earthquakes here. The Klamath Falls earthquakes that same year, a couple of magnitude sixes within a couple of hours of each other. And then in 1936, the Milton Freewater earthquake out at state line, a magnitude 5.7. That's it for the largest earthquakes in Oregon in recorded history. So we don't know how to prepare for earthquakes. If we lived in, how many of you have lived in California? and know how to prepare for earthquakes, I would imagine, right? Live, if you lived in the San Francisco area, Los Angeles, or many areas around California, because they happen all the time, and you get used to them even. Here, a 5.6 is a really big deal. Where the two plates come together, that's the continental shelf. That's also a 600 plus mile long earthquake fault. And it's a subduction zone. It's where the Juan de Fuca plate is diving under North America. Subduction zone earthquakes are much different than California earthquakes. California will never get an earthquake this big. Impossible. Because California earthquakes have epicenters where pretty much the energy from the earthquake kind of radiates out from the center. When a subduction zone earthquake happens, it rips the whole 600 mile long earthquake fault apart. And if it happens like many scientists think, it might start in the south and then move at a mile a second. And if it's a 600 mile long earthquake fault, it takes a long time to rip apart, moving a mile a second. Sometimes only parts of the subduction zone rip apart though. 
So you only get magnitude 8.8s or so. Yeah. That's, that's significant, though. Here's what it looks like with this nifty animation. So here we are in Oregon. We're going to dive under the ocean and then go down about 6 to 10 miles where the Juan de Fuca plate and the North American plate are grinding against each other. The edge of the North American plate is actually being pulled down with the Juan de Fuca plate. The pressure over hundreds of years becomes too great and the plates slip apart. North America will move as much as 15 or 20 feet to the west. Back up on land, here comes the primary wave. That's the first jolt you feel. And then here come the surface waves. Those are the waves that do the damage. With subduction zone earthquakes, you get long period earthquake waves. And I mean, you'll be able to see the waves if you're outside or in a building. You will see walls dancing. You will see the ground undulating. And because it's ripped the seafloor apart, it generates the tsunami for minutes and minutes and minutes this earthquake lasts. But it's long period earthquake waves and we'll talk about that. We know that our subduction zone can generate up to and larger than magnitude 9 earthquakes. We know that Cascadia subduction zone earthquakes last a long time. What makes a subduction zone earthquake different than floods or tornadoes is how many people are affected all at once. Everybody from Northern California up through Southern British Columbia, everybody west of the Cascades will be affected by this earthquake, will be shaken by this earthquake. And as I said, these earthquakes aren't killers. Amazingly enough, it's long period earthquake waves. Wood frame homes do pretty well in these types of earthquakes. Steel reinforced, concrete reinforced buildings do very well in these types of earthquakes. Brick and mortar buildings that have had no seismic strengthening do not do well in these types of earthquakes. So we all survive the earthquake, but these types of earthquakes wreak havoc on infrastructure roads and bridges. So now we're not going anywhere. Power. Some parts of Japan, they're still dealing with rolling blackouts three months later. Communications. Rigid water lines, rigid sewer lines, rigid natural gas lines, because long span objects love to resonate with long period earthquake waves. And so, for example, the big Fremont Bridge, in Portland, it starts dancing with these long period earthquake waves. And I haven't met anybody yet that thinks that that bridge will survive. ODOT did a study in 2009 where they modeled a magnitude 9 earthquake and looked at the 2,500 or so bridges that they're responsible for in the state. These aren't the county bridges or federal bridges or local bridges. These are the state maintained bridges. They found that about half of the bridges that they are responsible for would take one sort of damage or other, with the majority of damage taking place at the coast. Highway 101 ceases to exist and probably will be that way for years if we get one of these earthquakes. But I-5 also ceases to exist as a transportation corridor until it can be reopened. Heavy equipment brought in to reopen it, to get the overpasses out of the way and bypasses. I-84, same thing. There'll be dozens and dozens of landslides in the Columbia Gorge shutting down I-84. All the roads across the coast range are expected to suffer some sort of damage or other and be closed, as well as the Cascades. So now, here we are in Oregon, west of the Cascades, we are isolated from the rest of the United States. And it's going to take a while to mount a response. And they're not only coming to Western Oregon, the people in the white hats. They're coming to Western Washington. They're coming to Western Southern British Columbia. They're coming to Western Northern California as well. 13 million people will need help. And what we saw in Japan will be what we see here. 
Once again, everybody will survive the earthquake for the most part. It's dealing with the aftermath of the earthquake that becomes difficult. That's why we do things like this and emergency plans and kits and stuff. What is this? Ah, there we go. What we saw in Japan really wasn't typical of the type of damage that we would expect to see here in the Pacific Northwest and in Oregon. What happened in Chile last year is a much better example where a magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake, it lasted 90 seconds. That's the difference between a magnitude 8.8 .8 and a magnitude 9. A magnitude 9 earthquake is 10 times bigger than the magnitude 8.8. .8. It would take 10 magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquakes to equal a magnitude 9. 15 million people affected and only 521 fatalities. 400 of those from the earthquake itself. Roads and bridges. And Chile is at, is at least as prepared and probably better prepared than we are in the Pacific Northwest for these big earthquakes because they have had many of them over recorded history, big, big earthquakes. Saw some damage in big buildings, but for the most part, in subduction zone earthquakes, you don't see buildings pancaking. I've just seen a few pictures from Japan, and that's it. This is Santiago International Airport, think PDX. Closed for a week, not because of runway damage or control tower damage, but because of catastrophic damage inside the terminal itself. Non-structural damage. That's what happens inside buildings. That's where most injuries occur. Things fall on you. The joke is, take that rock collection you have above your bed, it's a geology joke, and you put it somewhere else where it won't fall on your pointy head when things start shaking. Bookcases bolted to the walls. Easy, simple things. If your water heater is not bolted to the walls and has flexible, doesn't have flexible hoses, easy things to work on. Non-structural things. First responders couldn't respond because just like you and I, if we get this earthquake, they're going through the earthquake themselves. And they're going to take care of their families first. And they're going to look into their, at their neighbors to make sure they're OK and check on their friends. And heck, they might not even be able to get out of their neighborhood if there are roads and bridges damaged. I think one of the great tragedies was to the wine industry in Chile. <laughs> and I can tell you that they are much better prepared, the wine industry in Chile is, for big earthquakes than we are here in Oregon. So my advice is start stocking up on Pinot. Come down with me on Saturday to the wine country. Put, a fi put aside you know, four or five nice cases of wine in a nice safe place. And after the earthquake is over, <laughs> eBay. <laughs> People will be clamoring for this rare wine. <laughs> An excellent idea. We know over the last 10,000 years that there have been 20 magnitude 9 plus earthquakes on the Cascadia subduction zone. That's about once every 500 years. And the last one was 311 years ago. New research by Dr. Chris Goldfinger from Oregon State University looking at offshore underwater landslides associated with these big earthquakes has found another 10 to 20 events where just the southern part of the subduction zone ruptures. Northern California up to about offshore Lincoln City or Newport. That's 40 times, 30 to 40 times over the last 10,000 years. And if it's 40 times, that's once every 250 years. Here's a chart. 10,000 years of human history. We're going to start in 8,000 BC. I charted those 40 events. These are the big magnitude 9 plus earthquakes. The little ones are the magnitude 8 to 9 earthquakes. And we take it through time. And you can see that over 10,000 years, we have a good record. And these happen on a regular basis. 
Sometimes it looks like there are some clusters that occur. Over the last thousand years, we've had four of these events. Three of them have been magnitude nine plus events. And if you take all 40 of these events together, 75% of them have happened less than 311 years apart. Go out another 50 years. 85% of these will have happened less than 361 years apart. So it is safe to say we are within the window for one of these earthquakes to happen. All of you who didn't know anything about subduction zone earthquakes. <laughs> I feel I have a healthy paranoia. All those folks who have taken CERT classes, they also have a, do you know what CERT is? Community Emergency Response Team Training? And we hope that when we take the break that you're gonna go out and talk to the CERT folks and the Red Cross folks and things like that. But I have a healthy paranoia. <laughs> but most of you will probably do like Homer Simpson. You'll go home, you forget about it because you got a really busy life, right? And the ground starts shaking and you will yell, oh! I really should have put that emergency plan in place and put away those supplies and stuff like that. Hopefully that won't happen. And the bottom line is, if you don't prepare for this event, you become a victim. And if you don't share this knowledge with your family and work with them on emergency plans and putting supplies away and emergency kits and all that stuff, you force them to become victims as well. And if you're not even sharing this information with your friends and neighbors, they become victims as well. We, you know, since we've only known about this for the last 20 or 25 years, it becomes an obligation for us, one of the reasons I preach this message. It is an obligation for us as this first generation to help our friends and family get prepared for an event like this. And this is a worst case scenario. Earthquakes are a high impact, low probability event. You prepare for an event like this, you're ready for the two inches of snow that paralyzes the community. <laughs> and you're stuck on the interstate for six hours because you got an emergency kit in your car. You're only as prepared, though, as the least prepared family in your neighborhood. Think about it. If we get a big earthquake, what are you going to do? You're going to check on your family, but you're going to go see how your neighbors are. And if they haven't prepared, you're a nice person, you're going to help them. If you forgot to prepare, those neighbors that did are going to come and be nice to you and help you. What we know about earthquakes, regardless of who it is in your neighborhood, 95% of everybody that's helped or rescued is helped or rescued by their neighbors in an earthquake. That's everybody is helped or rescued in an earthquake by your neighbors. Bake some cookies. <laughs> Go over to your neighbor's house. Althea, I don't know you well, but here are some cookies. I like cookies. Rescue me first. <laughs> They'd want a case of beer. But they're going to be very loyal after that, and they're going to come rescue you first. You get the idea. You got to spread the paranoia where you work and live as well. Think about if you belong to something other than CERT, because the CERT folks know what they're going to be doing. What is your organization scheme in an event like this? If you go to church, what is the church's role in an event like this? Think about human nature. Where will people go if there hasn't been power for three or four days besides the shelters? They're going to come to the schools. They're going to come to the churches, fire stations, police stations, city halls. How can you as a Kiwanis or Lions Club or Rotary member get your organization thinking about and preparing for an event like this? Any organization you belong to, any business that you belong to, what's your plan at your office if something happens and you can't get home to your family. Got a plan? Probably not. What about schools? How, if you've got kids in schools, what's the school's plan to take care of your kids or grandkids if you can't get there for a day or two? That's a question worth asking. 
Join the obsessed few in your community. And I don't mean the crazy people that stand on the street corners. I mean the CERT folks, the Red Cross folks. There are lots and lots of resources available to you. That's one of the reasons we're having this tonight is because you can go out and talk to the resources right out there. The Red Cross is a fantastic resource for classes and emergency gear. And there's plenty of information online if that's the way you want to start. OregonRedCross.org, ready.gov, lots of places you can go and get this information. But take the first step. That's what you got to do. Because earthquakes and tsunamis aren't in and of themselves disasters or catastrophes. It's the choices that we make that make them into disasters or catastrophes. They're hazards, like a big windstorm, like a wildfire. We also know that disasters are inevitable and they're personal. They happen to you and your family, whether it's a car accident or a house fire, a windstorm that knocks power out for a week or a giant earthquake. It's happening to you and your family. And so preparing for this worst case event prepares you for any type of natural disaster. All right, I talked, y'all wanna see about the surfing elephants? Yeah, all right. This is like the giant finale, okay? In 2004, the Boxing Day earthquake and tsunami that struck the Indian Ocean area off the coast of Sumatra killed over a quarter of a million people. A horrific event. But there's some amazing stories that came out of that event. One of them was Tilly Smith, the 10-year-old girl in Thailand who was at a resort, saw the water go out and told her parents and then they grabbed a whole bunch of people and headed up the hill because two weeks earlier she had learned from England that what tsunamis and earthquakes look like. So they headed up. The other story that came out of Thailand was the elephants. Thailand was far enough away from the earthquake epicenter, 600 mile long earthquake fault that ruptured, that they didn't feel the earthquake. And it took the tsunami about two hours to get to Thailand. But just before the tsunami arrived, the working elephants down at the coast got agitated and broke away from their handlers and headed up the hills. This is all in this children's book, Elephants of the Tsunami, a true story. Some of the elephants were carrying tourists, broke away from their handlers, headed up into the hills. Some of the working elephants, as the story goes, went back down to the beaches and let people climb on their backs and took them up the hill People saw this happening and large groups of people followed the elephants up into the hills just moments before the first tsunami wave arrived. So I've been, don't, oh, no, don't, can't do that. Yeah. I've been talking to coastal communities about buying elephants. They need, they need some, you know, revenue coming in now that timber's gone. So tourist attraction, instant tourist attraction. Now, you go down to Seaside, you go down to the prom, right? They've got one of those big things. You climb on the elephant with your friends and loved ones, and you've got a couple of bottles of Pinot, and the elephant goes out in the surf, and its sun is setting, and you're drinking Pinot, and you're riding on the elephant, and what you do is you put a big old sign on the elephant's butt that says, if I'm headed to high ground, follow me and there's your tsunami warning system. A lot more fun than sirens and people would actually know what it meant. Because you go to the coast now and you hear sirens go off, what's that mean, right? How many of you are at the coast for the uh, March 11th evacuations? And how far did you drive? We actually came during the morning. Oh, okay, so you went to see the wave come in. Now we call that the culling of the gene pool. <laughs> I have been, I, I have been researching, you got that, did you? I've been researching a very special breed of elephant, though, that I found that they've been training in Thailand. And 
I'm going to try to get communities interested in this. These are very expensive and there's just a few of them anywhere in the world. And if we get some of these over here, I think it's going to be amazing. The talent that these elephants have is when the tsunami is approaching, they hop on a surfboard, they ride out, they catch the wave, and then they're trumpeting as the tsunami's coming in. And they're very talented. And there's your tsunami warning system. I think it's a great idea. You'll need a bigger surfboard. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what they say? They work. They work. Oh, and even better, you can take the manure, bring it to the state capitol, and use it in the on the grounds of the state capitol. How appropriate! <laughs> Uh, tough audience. All right, so here's the final question for the night. Are you ready for the big one? Thank you.